Hello and welcome to the CIR Policy Cast, where we explore some of the most pressing issues in the world of dispute resolution. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Lucy Greenwood. Uh, Lucy is an international arbitrator with over 20 years of experience and has worked as counsel or arbitrator on over 60 arbitrations. She's also a, a chartered arbitrator, a member of the CIR Board of Trustees, uh, and a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you, Lewis, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, now, Lucy also has extensive experience of environmental issues, and most recently, some of you may be familiar with her work uh, with the Green Arbitrations Campaign. Now, that is very relevant to what we're here to discuss today. As you will know, uh, like every profession, the, the disputes resolution world has been greatly impacted by the, the, the pandemic and the associated lockdowns. And this has come against the backdrop of um, really a, an increased consciousness of the importance of sustainability in the profession uh, and the need to change working practices at quite a fundamental level to, in order to tackle the, the, the climate crisis, and also just to find new, um, more, more, more up-to-date and more suitable ways of, of operating in a way that actually preserves the integrity of the process. Now, there is a question mark over whether the current lockdown and its associated uh, changes to working practices, the greater uses of platforms such as Zoom, which is this, which this uh, podcast has been, been recorded on, um, greater use of remote procedures, um, less reliance on, on travel, whether, that, uh, whether the, the necessity uh, of those changes um, will actually bear fruit in the longer term and whether this could actually affect a paradigm shift in the way that professionals operate. That is what we want to, to discuss here today. Um, so first of all, Lucy, could you start by just telling us a little bit about why we should care about sustainability in the profession and what the, the current impact of, um, of arbitration on the environment is? Yes, thank you, Lewis. And it, and it is wonderful to, to um, have a spotlight shone on this because I think this is an area that has not received enough attention from the arbitration community until, until now, frankly. Uh, we've talked a lot about how we should arbitrate climate change disputes, but we haven't really ever properly engaged with the question of what our environmental footprint as a community is. And um, just to give a very short bit of background into um, the work I've been doing here, it, it, it really came about last summer when I was asked to speak at London International Disputes Week on a technology panel. And as I was preparing for the panel, I really, you know, it really brought home to me that we had all the technology at our disposal to operate our arbitrations in a more environmentally friendly manner. We just weren't using them. And really, when I looked at my practice as an arbitrator now in 2020, it's actually not that different from what it was when I first started out in the field, you know, back in the late 90s. We use email a lot, but we were still very much using hard copy materials. Um, and frankly, we were, we were way behind the curve. And just to go back to your question as why we should, why we should care about all this, uh, it's quite simple it's the right thing to do and we all need to recognize that we have we we play a part in this it comes down to personal responsibility and recognizing that individual actions can add up to to major changes thanks lucy i, I think that emphasis on on individual actions is 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 really key uh, and one of the things i've been really struck by with the the greener arbitration campaign is that it it is very pragmatic. Um, you're seeking to go beyond um, sort of high rhetoric about mm -hmm. what is important and look at, at a quite granular level what, what can be done um, in practical terms. Could you expand a little more on that and, and where you think both individuals and organisations have a, have a key role to play? Absolutely. And, and the Green Arbitrations 
initiative really started off as a very small pledge by me as an international arbitrator. It was a simple promise on my website that I will conduct my arbitrations in a more environmentally friendly manner. And I have um, a sample wording that goes into my procedural order number one, which says that I will expect that parties will submit their documents electronically unless they are expressly requested to say um, send hard copies. I will encourage council to consider that um, possibly taking minor witnesses by video link. And, and really it, it started life as that. Now since then there's been some wonderful support across the communities um, and it's expanded into a um, a wider concept of really taking whichever small part you might play in an international arbitration but looking at whether you can do that in a more environmentally friendly manner and what we hope to do is to really bring in all those key players and and you know there's a wide wide range going from you know institutions like the chartered institute who incidentally have done great things in putting all their journals um, online and, and all the um, electronic access that the Chartered Institute has, has driven forward in the last six months or so is, is a really, really very much a flagship for what we want institutions to be doing. But also considering the third party funders, the hearing venues, conference organizers. That's a major issue, obviously not, not so much at the moment, but I know we'll come on to that. Um, but trying to emphasize that it's as I go back to what I started by saying that this is a it has to be a team effort. Um, and the reason is that we conducted an environmental impact aware, um, assessment into the carbon footprint of a major international arbitration before we started to talk about these issues, because I'm a great proponent of ha on having empirical data to back up your assertions and we knew that the environmental impact was going to be significant because as a community what we are so willing to jump on a plane um, travel around the world at the drop of a hat bring witnesses in perhaps only for 20 minutes of testimony um, provide huge reams of hard copy bundles career them all over the country or all over the world I mean we knew it was going to be high um, but when we did the analysis, we were quite shocked and we looked at a major international arbitration and um, we found that the carbon footprint was so significant that it would require almost 20,000 trees to offset. So that was quite staggering. Mm -hmm. um, and we also found that three quarters of those emissions were as a result of flights. And it, it seems funny to look back at the beginning of this year because I had some wonderful um, lapel pins made um, of, of a little aeroplane. And I had a, a thing going where I would send somebody a, a lapel pin if they told me that they had not taken a flight this year for environmental reasons. And I had great fun in January and February of sending these little pins out um, by mail all over all over the world to people contacting me and saying, you know, I'm, I practice international arbitration, Lucy, and I can tell you that I have deliberately not taken a flight for environmental reasons. And then you look at where we are today and you say, you see that nobody's getting on planes. Mm -hmm. And what would be very, very interesting to see if there is a long-term change in our behavior. Um, I hope there will be. I hope that we will um, take stock of, of what we've learned and, and that this can be a very positive thing coming out of the pandemic. But it does seem bizarre to, to look back only a couple of months ago and think I was so desperately encouraging people not to take flights and then suddenly, as we know, the world changed. Yeah, I, it already feels like such a, such a different era. and. Um, yeah, perhaps not the uh, not the cessation that we we would have hoped for, but but nonetheless, um, it has brought to mind actually a lot of the old adages about necessity necessity being the mother of invention and and never letting a, a good crisis go to waste. I've I've had a real sense recently uh, right across the board that um, people are trying to see this as, a, as as the start of something bigger and and from. Uh, from obviously the very negative scenario of, of um, the current pandemic, trying to draw something positive out of that for the for the longer term. 
what would you, if you had to make an assessment now of the prospects for that, would you, would you say that they're quite high? Do you think that, that there'll be some backsliding or what, what do you think needs to happen to try and cement this as a, as a longer term shift? Yeah, and, and that's a great question, Lewis. And I think, you know, we have had change forced upon us, but we have acted uh, extremely dynamically, I would say, as a community to, to embrace that change. I mean, mm -hmm. here we are doing this. We wouldn't have been doing this necessarily back in January. Um, we are communicating on, on webinars. I have always been a proponent of, of deliberating through Zoom platforms with my co-arbitrators and using screen sharing software rather than physically meeting. But now we're doing that. You know, everyone's doing that. It's not just me and a, and a small group of, of arbitration practitioners who do that as a matter of course. Um, are the changes going to stay? I, th I think we will see more hybrid uh, proceedings happening. Uh, I don't believe we'll stay with the whole virtual arbitrations um, entirely, but I hope that we will see um, more willingness to, uh, to, as I say, take take witnesses, minor witnesses um, through video technology, uh, certainly more deliberations on the screen. I would also say that there, I think the pandemic will, is obviously, it's going to alter the economic situation for many, many companies. And arbitration is fairly, is uniquely placed to respond to that and to deliver a speedier alternative to the courts, particularly when we hear about the backlog that the civil courts are going through at the moment. So I, I very much hope that we can react to that and say we can produce a quicker results, cheaper. And one thing that we really were, were surprised about when we did the environmental um, analysis of the major arbitration was when we changed the assumptions to um, make the arbitration more environmentally friendly, we actually found that it, it was 40% cheaper in terms mm -hmm. of disbursements. And so that, that is actually, I think, often <laughs> a very big driver of behavior. Uh, so possibly the combination of wanting things to be more economic and more environmentally friendly may well lead to, uh, to lasting change. That's that's very encouraging. I, I can only speak from my own personal experience as well on a, on a very small level that um, prior to the pandemic, I wasn't using platforms like this to anywhere near the extent that I could be. Um, and I, I'm, for, for, from my own perspective, I'm, I'm very adamant that I don't want to revert back to face-to-face um, -face meetings being the default, unless there's a, there's a definite purpose there. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's something that I, I think we can, can continue with. Um, in terms of what may need to be considered uh, in terms of offering practical guidance on how professionals can make this work, so beyond just making the, the case for it, both on, on environmental, moral and ec economic grounds, as you've explained very succinctly, what, what can we do to equip professionals with the tools that they need to actually make this work um, and, and give them the knowledge that they'll need to, to, to do so while retaining the integrity of the process. Yeah, and you, and you touched on this at, um, at the beginning, Lewis, when you said about being pragmatic about this, and, and that has always been my approach. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's doing, it's making the small changes and sticking to them. So. Hard copy bundles is something that's a real bugbear of mine. I think they are immensely wasteful because no people look at the printing and think, okay, well, that is that is what it is. But they never look at the underlying resources that it takes to produce, you know, the, the pages and pages of bundles that we see in big arbitrations. They don't look at the associate time in checking the bundles. They don't consider the couriers. They don't consider the fact that as an arbitrator, the tendency is often to say, oh, well, I've got my hard copy set at home, but I'm not going to lug them to the hearing room. So it's fine. I'll just use the hearing room bundles. But then I don't really want them shipped back to my home office. So I'll just tell the law firms to shred them at the end. And it, 
so so I st that's where I started with this very small tr please can we have electronic bundles um, where possible we are obviously saying as a tribunal that we we may ask you for the odd exhibit in hard copy just because it's often easier to deal with very you know, complicated spreadsheets or plans in, in hard copy. Um, but the default should be electronic bundles. And, and then really just moving from there is more about thinking about your travel, which is very much where I was at the beginning of this year. I had really cut back on my travel a lot of what I have to do as an arbitrator is get out there, be seen, hope that people remember me when they want to appoint an arbitrator. So, so there's, there is that need for face-to-face for -face contact, really. But I had decided that I, if I, yeah, I couldn't go around telling other people not to fly and to jump on planes um, you know, myself. So I had very much cut back at the beginning of this year anyway. I was going to go to Paris Arbitration Week on the train and I was going to go to ICA on the train. And, and again, very much talking to other people, you could see people really responding to this. And I had a number of other people saying, I'm not getting a short haul flight to Edinburgh, I'm going to take the train and things like that. So that was encouraging. Um, but in terms of educating people, and you, you mentioned you know, what, what people can do in this space, I am very much a, a fan of simple how-to protocols, and that is something we are very much working on in the Greener Arbitrations Initiative. I have a wonderful steering committee uh, assembled now. We meet monthly, and I have a subgroup working on what we call our green protocols, and that is really going to be a how-to guide for an arbitrator, for counsel, for institutions, just say, if you want to try and reduce your carbon footprint, then, then do these, these fairly simple steps. Because I think one thing we don't take into account enough is that one assumes that everyone has the same level of knowledge and understanding about this issue. Mm -hmm. And they, they often don't. So if you take, for example, carbon offsetting, uh, you, that may mean all sorts of different things to different people or some people will just not know how to go about offsetting and and I was very glib about offsetting because I sort of in in the initial um, iteration of the green pledge it said I will offset um, you know the carbon emissions of any flights I take and then you look into it more and you realize that it's not quite that simple you know how, how do you offset some some of the offsetting initiatives are are better than others you know, you, there's 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 a lot of um i think potential confusion out there so again we're working on a very simple protocol which says you know, this is if you are going to offset and we suggest you offset at you know, that is the um least best alternative to to other actions if i can put it like that but if you are going to offset then this is how you do it um, so, so really, I'm, ho I'm hoping that those protocols will give a very good, um, almost you know, idiot's guide to how, how to be more environmentally friendly in your practice. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that, that kind of thing is imperative, really, because I, as I say, I, I, I would hope that the, the, the will is there more, more and more. Um, what people just need are the, the tools. And um, at the Institute, we, back in early April, um, from a slightly different direction, we produced the, the guidance note on remote proceedings, which was um, something we tried to turn around quite quickly in response to the, to the lockdown. But our hope is that, that the practical advice that that offers is something that can then be utilized and further developed. Um, so it, it really has started a conversation with the profession and been really encouraged with some of the, the feedback and that's been taken on. Um, I, I think in that regard, the profession does, does um, deserve quite a lot of credit for, um, for, for trying to adapt to, to this scenario. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, all the virtual arbitrations know how that really has been generated in a very short space of time. I mean, you know, the guidance, mm. but also other other practice notes out there is is a fabulous uh, resource and you know it's a real testament to the community that we've been able to produce this um, so quickly 
and it has such great synergies with with the environmental side. You know, I was, I'm just so excited to be. You know, a, there's been a great deal of support for the for the green initiative, but uh, B, there's an awful lot of really ready-made material out there that, that we can use. Um, and we have had amazing support, and and the institutions, other you know, the more commercial institutions have have also produced very impressive guidance on this. Um, and we've been working with a number of institutions to, to sort of tailor that to the more environmental and the focus side as well. So, so um, it, it is great to see everyone working together, lots of cross institution working on this area, which is, which is really encouraging. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think just um, one of the, my final questions was really about the uh, wh whether there are any more complex questions about sustainability that need to be considered. Um, I think the, the obvious things that, that always sprang to mind for me was um, the, the, the classic image of um, lots of people getting flights to take part in an arbitration. Um, as, and I mean, as you alluded to earlier, aviation contributing three quarters of that, that carbon footprint. Um, now, obviously, people still need to operate and they need to operate in some way. But I was quite interested recently when I saw that the, the carbon footprint of the Internet um, now rivals that of aviation. Um, there isn't a, a simple answer here, but do, would you have any kind of thoughts on, on how that might be integrated with our thinking on this? Yes, and, and, and I mean, at the, at the beginning of this discussion, you, you very kindly said I was very experienced in all this. And the, and the short answer is, you know, I have educated myself over the last 12 months as I have become uh, you know, more involved and, and very passionate about, about changing our behavior. Because you, when I look at how arbitrations are run, they are wasteful, but mm -hmm. the uh, the email issue is is something that's that's on our radar. Um, and as you say, there's no easy answer. I've been reading up on this um, recently, and it, and it is it is yeah um, very concerning. Um, and we want to make sure that you know we are help, helping people make the best choices but also understanding that we as a community as I say we are not very well developed in this area anyway so if we again going back to starting small I, I hope we will be able to educate people in in due course as to the sort of more complex issues which uh, use of the internet and even you know ccing or bccing numerous people and where those emails go I mean yeah certainly wasn't something I was particularly aware of even six months ago and now I, I have changed the way I, I use email accordingly but you know it's again one tiny tiny step um, so so yes I mean it, it is a real concern what we're working on next uh, I th and I think this is very important is to expand and re refine our research into the environmental footprint so as I say and this was with the great help of Deckert um, LLP, who, who have really pushed this forward um, on behalf of the steering committee. We conducted this detailed analysis into one major international arbitration. And we, we took a number of assumptions based on Deckert's caseload. You know, basically put together a, a detailed case study with, with the certain assumptions. But it was a major arbitration Roughly, the case study was around sort of 30 to 50 million dollars in dispute. What we want to do now is to look at a smaller arbitration and then, you know, a, what, what the international arbitration community would say, very small arbitration, say $500,000 to a million in dispute, and to see whether there is significant changes as a result. I suspect we will still see a significant footprint. But as we work to refine our research, we will then endeavor to try and build in an element which reflects uh, the internet usage to try and see whether we can quantify that. Um, and we're currently consult trying to look into whether we can work with some carbon trust companies to um, the, the carbon trust in particular to uh, to see if we can actually 
produce a more refined analysis as, as, as we go on. And then finally, we're going to add a piece looking into conference attendance, um, because again, that is something that has been a big part of our um, industry. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's something that we suspect will have a very significant carbon footprint. I think that kind of data will be incredibly valuable. And I think the, the fact that you're already raising an awareness of these issues, I was struck within the, the, the Greener Arbitration Pledge that um, already quite early on you, you had in there a note about being mindful that, that it has a, a carbon footprint as well. Um, I think once we then get more evidence to back that up, then you can start to affect the, the behavioural change. So, so that's, that's really positive. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've never been some. I, you, I always feel it's better to do something than nothing. And, and often with these things, you can almost get stymied into, well, I need to close off every single little avenue before I actually, you know, come out and say, do something. So our, our mm -hmm. approach has been very much to, to raise awareness, to get people talking about this. You, we've, we've had great support, as I say, and, and, it's just nice to, to hear that discussion taking place and, and people trying to um, act in a, in a more environment, just being more aware of the issue has, has been very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, um, it's, it's really quite inspiring uh, to see that work, work taking place and, and to see you leading the way in that, that regard. Um, and it's, it's, it's had a, a real impact on decision making within the Institute. Um, I mean, as, as you mentioned earlier on, with our, our decision to go digital only with the, the publications, um, is a direct result of this this change in mentality. Uh, that's right. That's right. And and I mean, you know, as a back to positives coming out of the pandemic um, across the globe, it, institutions have had to change the way they operate with regards to hard copies. Have had to accept soft copies of awards and, and all sorts of things, uh, other communications, in a way that I think would have taken a lot longer had this not occurred. And um, I doubt they will go back now on, on those small points about how they accept submissions and things. And, and so, and I, I take that as a real positive. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so finally, Lucy, is there any, if there was just one um, single takeaway that you'd want our audience to, to have from, from this discussion, uh, what would you say that would be? What's your, your call to action, as it were? Well, very simply is that they can go along and sign up to show their support for the Greener Arbitrations uh, campaign. Um, currently hosted on my website, which is greenwoodarbitration.com, but we are working very hard to have a standalone website um, ready and online, uh, probably in the next month or so actually yeah, it's coming on well and and if if you do that it really helps us see who's out there we'll be you know, regular updates as to when when things are going live when the protocols will be ready things like that so so selfishly that would be great if people could could go on and, and sign up their support there otherwise i would i simply would say that I think we should all remember, a lot of us are very, very good in the environmental sphere in our personal lives. We're all good at recycling, we think about what we're doing, we think about perhaps eating ethically, all these kind of things. We, we, I think we kind of abandon that responsibility when we get to the office. Mm -hmm. And so, I, because I think it just becomes not, not my problem and you know, Somebody in my law firm will think about how the law firm manages its environmental footprint or, you know, yes, I'll, I'll recycle the odd document into the bin, but I really won't think very much about being active in my workspace to question the decisions that are being made in terms of their environmental impact. And so I would say try and take your, don't take your environmental hat off when you get to work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's as simple as that. You question what's happening in your professional life, in the way you look at your personal life and you talk to your children about environmental issues. So, so don't have that divide. Try and, try and think it, uh, it, it, it all, about it all in a very sort of holistic way. So that's a bit of a woolly answer, but you know what I'm getting at. 
No, not at all. I, I think it's absolutely correct. And um, it's, it's only with those that, that um, aggregate of individual changes that we can, can really see something that, that amounts to a, a wholesale shift in, in the way that we operate. I think it's really important. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's been a really stimulating discussion, Lucy. Um, I'm delighted, as I say, that you've been, been able to, to, to join us today. Um, and I'd also like to, to thank all of our, all of our audience uh, for, for watching this as well. And I, and I hope that they've found it as, as interesting and as illuminating as I have. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lewis, for having me today. Thank you.